10,000 men of Harvard want victory today, for they know that our old Eli, their Harvard holds sway. So then we'll conquer old Eli's men, and when the game ends, we'll sing again. 10,000 men of Harvard gained victory today. 10,000 men of Harvard want victory today, for they know that our old Eli, their Harvard, holds sway. So then we'll conquer old Eli's men, and when the game ends, we'll sing again. 10,000 men of Harvard gain victory today. 10,000 men of Here's Paula I feel kind of guilty because you guys have like a whole ton of energy and then there's me. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I wish I had a degenerative disease. And I'm sure I'm going to rot in hell for saying that and I don't care. I'll tell you why. Because I'm tired and achy all of the time anyways. I know I'm not going to feel any worse and the exact same behavior I have now would be considered courageous. I'd roll out of bed about noon and somebody in the other room would whisper, she insisted on getting up. <laughs> and I don't want to live a long time anyways. I don't want to be old. I, don't, I know Willard Scott thinks he's doing a tribute to old people in the morning. It doesn't look like something to achieve, in my opinion. <laughs> Hold up some picture, some toothless old thing. Go, look, it's Minnie Sue. She's 104 and still stands up. Oh, that is a goal. Look at poor Burl Ives. There, he, the guy even was a contributor, for heaven's sakes. He dies, and there he is in the upper corner. Not even the, not even the main page of the Inquirer. The upper corner of the Inquirer, looking all sweaty and gross. And it has underneath it, it says, Inside Burl Ives' courageous last words. Apparently, just before he died, he said, And I don't care. He was singing Jimmy Crack Corn. He was out of his head. <laughs> These are courageous last words. I have no faith. I don't believe in anything. Nothing happens after you die. I, 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 do, I do celebrate, I guess, what would be considered Christian holidays. Uh, you know, um, you know, like, well, Christmas. What's interesting is I actually like the Jewish holidays better. I mean, this is not including any kind of faith whatsoever. Uh, um, but, like, I think, you know, the idea of the, the one celebrated at, Christmas, at, at December, I mean, um, you know, light a candle each night, an evening with friends, one gift, instead of open a bunch of presents, be depressed by noon. I think this, <laughs> you know, I think, and I have a lot of friends who are the same as me, including no faith whatsoever. They do tend to celebrate what would be considered the Christian holidays. And I think the reason for this is that the Jews don't have any little animated characters. <laughs> I think their religion could catch on more commercially. If the, you know, the Hanukkah raccoon, the Passover turtle, something. I don't believe anything. There's nothing. There's just nothing. I, and you know, I met Shirley MacLaine once, and uh, I, I was all excited to meet her because I like her work and everything, and I did that thing where you're like excited to meet somebody and then you don't know what to say and kind of trip over yourself. I said, yeah, I loved you in terms of endearment. And then I heard myself say, <laughs> I go, oh, but I don't believe in that many lives thing. I'm like, why am I telling what I believe to Shirley MacLaine? 
Well, when you think about it, you know, for thousands of years and generations upon generations, there have been priests and nuns and seekers and sitters on top of mountains and, 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 and philosophers. What are the odds of Shirley MacLaine being the one person to get the answer? <laughs> I just don't think it makes sense. I don't think I have any philosophy behind, like I don't have any, well, except for that Walmart commercial. Do you know the Walmart commercial? Where the guy, where the guy, the, the guy in the wheelchair, with, he's a real good looking guy with products in his hair and he's got his blue Walmart vest, his little name tag on it. And he, they show him doing different things around the Walmart store, you know, wheeling old ladies packages out to the parking lot and showing people where products are in the store and shucking little kids on the cheek and ringing up things in the cash register. And then he, over top, he's talking and he says that he thinks that, uh, a person's purpose in life is to make everyone else's day a little bit better, just in little ways, nothing major, just a smile here and there, make life smoother in a day for them. And I share that view, and therefore I find a very moving commercial. <laughs> no, I well up, or honest to God, you know, I tear up over this commercial on the right day. And then he goes on to say that, 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 that he thinks things happen for a reason, which seems to be a reference of some sort to his handicap, I think. And, I'm so moved by the commercial, and then I realized, wait a minute, what does that have to do with Walmart? <laughs> you know, do they have all wheelchair people working in there? I, don't. I went to the Walmart near my house, I said, is the guy in the wheelchair working today? <laughs> he was not there. The closest I came was my cashier had a front tooth uh, missing. <laughs> and she had not yet adopted this philosophy, but... It looked like the next tooth was about to go, and I think after that, she will accept that her purpose in life is to serve me there in the Walmart. <laughs> Does anybody know who that guy is, by the way? Is there a Harvard student here who knows who that guy is? <laughs> Good. So it's a beautiful tribute, and... Certainly a man's life's work not forgotten. <laughs> what if it's just some prank from a recent class? <laughs> we have no idea who it is. Um, just, no one, are, are there Harvard students here by any chance? <laughs> oh, for Christ's sakes. There's one right there, you don't know who that guy is? No, it's not, probably not required. <laughs> you can probably get a jury without having any idea who that guy is. Um, what are you studying? Women's studies. Women's studies? So, are you getting credit right now? <laughs> because, yeah. I am, by all accounts, a woman. And, uh, you know, in a way, just sitting, listening, would be studying. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Did you have classes today? One. One? Well, you know, when you're studying women, you have to pace yourself. A lot of uh... I think even Senator Packwood could tell you that. There's a pacing. There's a, you don't rush in. I'll be honest with you, I hate women. There it's been said. I think we're stupid and boneheaded. I've, I'm sick of women. I've had it with them. Every, you know, in 1992, we get a couple of women into the Senate, and they're all yipping around at their acceptance speeches, saying, the year of the woman, the year of the woman. What fat white guy came up with that phrase? <laughs> the year of the woman. You realize it's over with now. <laughs> we gals had our year. We're so exhausted. We're giving it back to you fellas. Sure was a fun year, though, wasn't it? <laughs> I'll tell you. you guys, we got six women in the Senate, and that was considered the year of the woman. Six women in the Senate. We are 52 percent of the population. Apparently, women do suck at math. <laughs> my, my, one time, my brother picked me up by my neck, and I told my dad, you know, because it hurt, and so I complained. I said, you know. Jimmy picked me up by the neck and he said, well, did you do anything that would cause him to pick you up by the neck? <laughs> well, what behavior exactly would fall into that category? <laughs> yeah, I stood in a hole with just my head coming out. I... <laughs> I see now.
I had the opportunity, you know, the, uh, I, I believe that this issue is on its way to the Supreme Court, actually, the, the thing going on in Colorado with the um, Amendment 2, which was uh, to prevent cities from including in their charters protections of civil rights for people based on their sexual orientation. And there was a group called Colorado for Family Values who spearheaded that amendment, and now the argument about it's going to the Supreme Court. I had occasion to meet um, Will... Perkins, who's the head of Colorado for Family Values. He owns Perkins Chevrolet in Colorado Springs. And um, I went and I interviewed him uh, for Mother Jones Magazine, and he said to me that uh, he, he doesn't like to be called a homophobe, by the way, uh, that he does not discriminate, he said. In fact, he felt that he could relate to homosexuals, he said, because he's a car salesman. And he said, people make fun of our pants and our white shoes. <laughs> and I thought, yes, that is so similar, really. <laughs> that must be hell for you. <laughs> he went on to tell me that he th until the 10th grade, he didn't like girls, he said. He, he found that often they were smarter than him in school and he was intimidated by them. He didn't think that they were interested in sports, and so he didn't know what to say to them. He just didn't like girls until about the 10th grade, he thought, and that if prior to that, um, a, a homosexual teacher or counselor had talked to him, they could have talked him in to coming over <laughs> to their side. Now, I don't pretend to know the psychological or physiological reasons for anybody's sexuality one way or the other, but I had no idea that it might even possibly be based on a giant game of Red Rover, Red Rover. <laughs> you know, I don't even, I don't even know, though, how anybody can stay informed anymore. You know what I mean? It's so hard, really, to access real information. And, and now, I don't know if you knew this, but censorship is on the rise in, in, in our country, in our libraries, in our public schools. One of the most frequent co complaints is about sex education books. Um, they think that they're too sexually explicit, which always makes me laugh. I, <laughs> I think if you're going to teach sex education, it should be fairly sexually explicit. The books in particular, otherwise, what do you got? Like a book of hints, how nice. I... <laughs> you wouldn't do anything else, you know, what do they want? Like a picture of a totally dressed man and a totally dressed woman with a caption that goes, and then they? <laughs> you know. There's no, you wouldn't teach any other course that way. You wouldn't teach history and just say, you know, in 1776, something happened. If you're a real American, you'll know what it was. <laughs> Who is this, this guy here with the red tie. What, what do you do for a living, sir? Engineering. You do engineering? Where do you do your engineering at? Mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering. Can you see that that's a what and not a where, sir? <laughs> so where do you do your engineering? Mechanical engineering. <laughs> sir, get off the script, damn it. It's like as if you went over it in your head before you left the house. I'll tell her engineering, and then I'll tell her mechanical engineering. <laughs> I don't care what anybody asks me. I'm only going to say mechanical engineering. <laughs> Do you enjoy it? It's uh, mechanical, and yet it is indeed engineering. So where do you do your mechanical engineering, sir? In Fitchburg. In company, Fitchburg? A company called Moduform. Moduform? Module form? <laughs> Is that what you always wanted to do since you were a boy, was someday work for module form? <laughs> what exactly do you do for them? Like, what project are you working on right now at module form? Developing new furniture. Developing new furniture? Right. Like? <laughs> like? For corrections. Somehow the chair isn't good enough anymore? <laughs> Most of our furniture goes into correctional facilities, jails. New furniture for corrections facilities? <laughs> so you don't want it to be that comfortable, right? Most of your furniture goes into jails? Huh. 
I don't understand. How do you sell? Like, who sells it to the jail? Our distributors. Your distributors? And how do they? So they? Do they just cold call? <laughs> yeah, hi, Folsom Prison. I'm from Module Form. <laughs> I was wondering, have you noticed a lot of the inmates standing? could be because you need Moduform prison furniture. <laughs> I never heard of such a thing. Where did you, how did you get the job at Moduform? How did you know that you wanted to go make prison furniture? It's so distinct, sir. I don't know how you train for that. I don't know what the mentality is behind the furniture other than probably like beanbag chairs, you don't want a lot of hard things. You don't want things that can be dismantled and used as weapons, right? So mostly it's like foam chairs and stuff? A lot of vinyl. A lot of vinyl, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and you design these things? Yeah. And based on what information, do you go to the prisons and see like what looks like it would help? Our, our field salespeople do. They go out and survey the marketplace and see what's required. Your, your, your salespeople go out and survey their marketplace? Uh-huh. I love it that the jail itself is considered a marketplace. Not exactly a free market, sir. Just pretty much whatever you say goes in that area. And they come back with what kind of information? Like, what were you told before you invented your last chair? Pricing. Pricing? Uh-huh. Because a lot of the prisoners are, what, cheap? You know, if only they'd have, like, more rich prisoners. <laughs> I think that would work out a little bit better. Um, all right, so, so pricing is a major feature in your prison furniture? Durability. How Durability. Long, how long the furniture will last? How long? The, and the vinyl lasts quite a while, does it? Yep, very sure, because they don't have cats. As soon as they get a cat in that prison, it is all over for that vinyl furniture, let me tell you. Because we have a little vinyl couch for the kids and the cats have just torn it to shreds. I've, uh, my flight's at 8.30 uh, in the morning. By the way, Barry Manilow's fans go with him to the airport, but that's totally up to you. <laughs> I, was the, I was the only passenger on a flight one time, on a, a, a 30-seater, it was a puddle jumper, but it was about a 30-seater flight. I was the only passenger and the, there was a pilot and co-pilot and they had the nerve to talk to me over the PA thing. <laughs> the co-pilot gets on, the captain has turned on the seatbelt sign. I'm sitting right behind the guy, I tap him on the shoulder, I go, I, I'm sitting right here for Christ's sakes. I mean the captain's turned on, we're sharing a seatbelt, what what's the matter with you? <laughs> then they actually, this is a really humiliating thing, they asked me to move for ballast. It could have been worse, they could have said, could you just move your left leg? That would have been more. You know, the plane is crooked. If you could just throw that over the aisle there, that would help us. So I pick up my bag, they said, anywhere, be anywhere behind row five. So I pick up my carry-on bag and I drag it back to row six and I plop down the seat and the guy gets on the PA and goes, we see you've chosen the emergency exit row. <laughs> and then he starts giving me the emergency exit row thing about how, you know, are you willing to get are, 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 you, are, you, are you willing to get the uh, other passengers off? Look, I'm the only passenger, I believe I'm willing to help get me off. <laughs> I think I could do that little service. Now they've tightened up security at the airport and they, and they have this, uh, right, uh, on an audio loop, this announcement that says, um, if anyone approaches you and tries to give you a bag, um, that <laughs> you need to alert the police or an airline representative. Well, there's quite a gap between those two <laughs> positions of authority, aren't there? Now, one can arrest him, and one can insist that he put his seat back forward. <laughs> there's the bomber right there. Sir, you're going to have to check that. <laughs> so now, uh, Harvard students, like this, this woman on the end with the, with the Harvard uh, sweatshirt, um, what are you studying here? Psychology. Psychology? And did you have class today? I'm not in psychology. <laughs> You're not in psychology? Is that what you said? No, 
No, it, was a, it wasn't a psychology-related class. It doesn't have to be a psychology-related <laughs> class, ma'am. Was that the question? What the hell's the matter with you people? <laughs> How did you get in this school? You must have had incredible recommendations because the things you could fill out yourself are limited. No, what class did you have today? Um, I had a midterm in a Myth of America. You had a midterm on America? That's where I got. What'd you say? Myth of America. It's a class. Myth. Myth class? <laughs> Myths of America? Is America in your answer anywhere, ma'am? It was a Myths of America class and you had a midterm? Mm -hmm. what, um, what myths are there in America? <laughs> You really want me to answer? <laughs> Is that what you answered on the exam? <laughs> Shy people taking tests. What myths are there in America? You don't really want to know. American freedom? Yeah, that is a myth. <laughs> as, as, as his clientele can easily tell you. <laughs> they don't even get to sit unless he goes to work every day. <laughs> Comes up with another creative chair idea. I mean, at a certain point, all the chairs have been invented, have they not, sir? <laughs> I mean, at a point, they're sitting. I don't care if it's vinyl or not, they're sitting. Do they need more? Seems odd. All right, what other myths? <laughs> American freedom, that's, that's a myth. What else? Uh, the whole thing was on three different authors, Emerson, Hawthorne, and Douglas. Emerson, Hawthorne, and Douglas, yeah. And um, so if there are different beliefs on religion as being a conformist society, uh, there was... <laughs> <laughs> How did you do on this exam? <laughs> did you do well? I think so. <laughs> you have no way of knowing, of course, until... <laughs> what, um, what's the name of the professor? <laughs> um. <laughs> I think it's called. Ber I think his name is Berkovich. You think his name is Berkovich? <laughs> Potentially a myth, though. <laughs> exactly. Did you think his name is Berkovich? Is that what you said? Berkovich. Berkovich. What makes you think his name is Berkovich? Why would you, why would you think someone's name was Berkovich and not know one way or the other? Wasn't it in the, when you signed up for the course, wasn't the name of the instructor one of the things? I have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea? Was it on the top of the paper today? This is the first question on the myth thing. Is my name Berkovich? <laughs> and you put C, undecided. Or do, you, or do you live in a dorm here at Harvard? Yeah. I oh, that's the cutest little thing I ever did hear of. <laughs> are there any of the people in your dorm in your Berkovich class? Yeah, a lot. Are they all here or there, some of them are back there still? <laughs> no, they're here. They're all here? Well, some of them. Is there anybody here got a cell phone? What? Oh, there must be someone. You have a cell phone on you? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. We have a whole audio team here that can easily reassemble this phone. <laughs> oh, what amazes me is he was so confident of my ability to catch that he didn't toss it like this here. He threw it like overhand. <laughs> For Christ's sakes. Engineers here?
Apparently there's an extra piece. You know, if you had this held in a fixed position, this could be a remarkably light, comfortable, durable chair for a tiny little prisoner. Is there anybody back at the dorm? What, what's the phone number there? made a seal-like noise, did they not? <laughs> That's the weirdest thing. Somebody was like, oh! <laughs> Who am I calling? Who is this? My roommate, Emily or Ellen. Your roommate, Emily or Ellen? You are not good with names, are you? <laughs> it's because she's got to have one name or the other. Do you ever notice when you say, Ellen? <laughs> Hold it. Wait a minute. Are you Emily? Hi, it's Paul Poundstone calling. <laughs> hi. Hi, your roommate is here? <laughs> and she doesn't know if her professor's name is Berkovich or Ellen. <laughs> is, do, are you in her, what class is it? Oh, American myth class? You think I want Emily? <laughs> yeah, we're at the show, yeah. <laughs> what, what are you, like a detective or something? How'd you come up with that? She has this huge crowd in the background when I say it's Paula Poundstone. She's like, would this be at the show? Boy, you can put... <laughs> I, I was... Look, she's totally f flipping out, like as if... <laughs> She says, how did I get her phone number? Can you add nothing up in your head? <laughs> it's, it's, it's Jessica for murder, she wrote. <laughs> I've got a hunch where you might have gotten my phone number. <laughs> um, is, uh, wait, so I'm talking to Ellen? Ellen, what are you studying? <laughs> well, not right now, just... <laughs> English, just in general? Uh-huh. All of it? Every last word, Ellen? You have to read a tremendous amount? Uh-huh. What are you reading tonight? The Marble Fern? Or the Marble Fawn? I'm not familiar with it. Nathaniel Hawthorne, is he Scarlet Letter? By the way, where does Demi Moore get off? <laughs> First indecent proposal and now the scarlet letter. It's a perfect transition. Her eyes, she always looks like she's about to cry. I, you know, I just feel like, could you just do a big full boo-hoo and get those... It's like she's got glaucoma, but she's turned it into a career. Ellen, how come you didn't come tonight? <laughs> oh, because you're studying. Uh-huh. And the marble fawn is good? Mm-hmm. Um, all right, I just wondered if you knew the name of uh, Dana's teacher, because... It is Berkovich. It's what? Sack von Berkovich? <laughs> Ellen knew the first name. She's got, like, Alzheimer's or something. <laughs> I gotta tell you something. In this crowd, she fits in. <laughs> All right, Ellen, it was really nice talking to you. I, I gotta, you know, because I'm, you know... Well, I'm busy, yeah. <laughs> it, no, I, yeah, it's, I should probably get going. All right, uh, you know, I'll talk to you later, I guess. <laughs> but, well, you don't have to just hang up. No, I'm teasing. Bye. Good night. It was nice talking to you. How the hell do you live with her? <laughs> yeah.
engineer, you hand this, you just hand this to the engineer. He's back there. See if you can put that other piece in for that guy. I don't know where the hell that came from. It just, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a hard light plastic. It's a material you may be familiar with working with. And don't go no making phone calls on that either, because don't think we won't call Modjuform up and bust your butt. I don't want you to go to prison and have to sit in your own little chairs. By the way, you guys, just in terms of, you know, the subject of the year, if you decide to kill someone, and I'm not suggesting that you should, but if you decide to, for God's sakes, do the rest of the country a favor. And if you use gloves, wear those clippy things. <laughs> we don't need to sit through that crap again. <laughs> I'm a big Clinton supporter. I would like him uh, to be president. You know, I like him. Uh, I think one thing, you know, he campaigned on chains, and certainly he's brought that about, you know, he doesn't have some dog greeting him at the helicopter. I think that alone, <laughs> that alone is change enough for me. I think all those presidents who had dogs greet them at the helicopter were creating a false sense of security for themselves, you know? What was that slobbery thing that Bush had, that thing that wrote all those books? What was that dog's name? Yeah, Millie, no matter what Bush did, every time he come off that helicopter, that dog run over, slobber all over. Oh, great job, Mr. President. <laughs> we don't care who you vomit on, we love you. Come on out of there. <laughs> Clinton, Clinton gets greeted at the uh, helicopter by Socks, the cat. You often don't see her on the news footage because of the propellers. She gets blown back into the trees, but she's there. <laughs> I saw, I saw, I saw a, a, an interview with Ralph Reed the other day where he said that, uh, you know, he thought Colin Powell was pro-family. I thought, well, okay, that narrows the pack politically, doesn't it? <laughs> what is pro-family? What politician goes forward and says, you know, it's the family I hate? <laughs> you know? And by the way, you know, until we get the money out of politics, it doesn't really matter, like, what issues you're behind. They're not really going to be serviced. It doesn't matter which way you feel about it, because you have to raise money. And therefore, one of the most powerful groups in, in our form of government, unfortunately, is the NRA, which is a staggering thought. They, uh, and I know there's probably some NRA people in here. There's probably some supporters. And I know the argument, the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment, oh, oh the right to bear arms. Well, that's not the whole text of the Second Amendment. You know, it's, not, it's, it's for the purpose of a well-organized militia, not so that crazy neighbor Bob can have an Uzi. <laughs> Every now and then I kind of play devil's advocate with myself even, and I say, well, maybe that is what they meant. Maybe they did mean so that everybody could have a gun if they particularly chose to. And then I think, well, yeah, but they weren't thinking about... They were thinking about <laughs> And then I think, well, certainly Ben Franklin was quite a visionary. He certainly knew about a lot of things ahead of time. Maybe he did mean that kind of a gun. Maybe that is what I meant. And then I think, well, maybe they were wrong. We have this way of revering our forefathers as if they never made a mistake. Well, you know, they may be like our real fathers. They weren't right about everything. <laughs> they had slaves. They had slaves, they wore layers upon layers of clothing in a sweaty hot summer in Philadelphia when they wrote the Constitution, for God's sakes. They're like sweating like hideous pigs passing the wig powder. I don't think they were right about everything. I wonder if I'll ever make enough money to be a Republican. I don't think so. I know that's how it works. You start out with a certain good feeling in your heart, and then one day, just ching, ching, you get to that amount, and you're like, well, you know. You know, I think we should take care of our people, but not at my expense. <laughs> I saw Bob Dole on the Senate floor one day. Now, if there's anything that I really, truly dislike 
Ross Perot for, and there's many things, I guess, but the main thing to me would be leaving us with the legacy of the chart. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 a, it's an inadequate explanation of whatever information they have there. You know, it's, 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 it treats us like idiots. It's over, if, oversimplification of whatever issue they're dealing with. I saw Bob Dole on the Senate floor one time when I was watching C-SPAN. He had a chart with an easel and a pointer and a graph there that showed, uh, it was right after the president had proposed his first budget proposal, showed one line going up like this here and another line going down like this, a red line, a blue line. So the red line uh, indicates the president's budget proposal, what it will do to the deficit. And then the blue line showed what the Demo uh, Republicans' alternative plan would do. And it shot straight down. Isn't there some sort of standardized set of numbers that we deal with, by the way, in terms of economics? Isn't there, isn't there some science behind this? How could that possibly be? I thought, what, well, does the president know? <laughs> oh, my God, look at that. What, did the batteries run out in his calculator or something? How could that have happened? How could the Democrats be that wrong and the Republicans be that right? That's an amazing thing. And then I think, well, wait a minute, weren't there Republican presidents for 12 long years? Didn't they virtually invent the deficit? <laughs> Bob Dole never brought that up. I said, Bob, how come you didn't mention it for 12 years? Just didn't want to. If I were him at this point, I would keep my mouth shut. Bob Dole turned down money, campaign contributions from gay Republicans uh, this year. I totally supported what he did. Not because they're gay, but because they're stupid. <laughs> gay Republicans. Uh, how exactly does that work, gay Republicans? <laughs> we disapprove of our own lifestyle. ourselves up in parking lots. <laughs> I have, I don't know, sex has just, sex has never been my area, which is good. <laughs> my campaign contributions can be accepted from all quarters now, thank goodness. Because I don't know, just not, you know, I don't have that, I don't have like that side, I don't care to, I, no, uh, no one is much attractive to me, and I don't care to be much attractive to anybody else. I just, you know, I, I, I was thrown out of Victoria's Secret. Uh, <laughs> I, ga I gave the secret away, and they, uh, <laughs> they just frown on that. I buy my underwear at Sears in bulk <laughs> about every eight to ten years. I buy a thick, cottony, high-waisted brief. It's not supposed to be attractive. It's there to do a job, God damn it. I, just, I, 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 I go about, you know, I wear it. I go about it really every eight to 10 years. I wear the underwear until, until, until it all has those little gold safety pins holding it up, you know. Until it's really just an idea. It's not even a garment anymore. The elastic usually goes out in about the seventh year, at which point I cut it and tie it each time. <laughs> the last time I bought my underwear at Sears, I, 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 um, I hadn't been there in several years, of course, and so I measured myself with a tape measure beforehand, because I use the kind where you find the, ch the chart on the back in the plastic package with the wrapped around the cardboard, three pair. And, and you use, you know, your height and weight and everything to determine, you know. And, uh, so I went there and I chose out what seemed to be my size and I got 15 packages of three underwear. They had to call over another checker there at Sears. Um, and they recognized me, they were very excited. They said, it's the woman who buys the underwear. So anyways, I bought the underwear, I opened the plastic package the next day, I unfurled the largest underwear I have ever seen in my life. It filled the sky before me. It was like a giant pizza pie dough or something. It just, it, just, it just took to the air. It was like when the Japanese participate in the Olympic march and they have that big white... And 
I couldn't take it back because the only thing more embarrassing than buying underwear at Sears every eight to 10 years is not knowing your own size when you do it. <laughs> so I roll it down. Um, let me just show you there. If I wore a bra, I could tuck it under there and have like a onesie kind of a thing. But... I, uh, yeah, it's class all the way. That's why I wanted to be here at Harvard. They were so worried that I would say a bad thing about Harvard. I don't have anything bad to say. Seems lovely. I'm having a nice time, aren't you? It's really beautiful, huh? Did you see the ceiling? That is not right. That happened when they had the international fountain competition in here. My youngest daughter was uh, invited to participate in international peekaboo competition this year. Uh, she's 18 months old and an incredible uh, peekaboo. It uh, took place in Madrid this last summer. Uh, it's incredibly competitive. Uh, one of the participants cracked and, and, and said, Bull peak. Uh, one of the fans from his country shot him. Remember that stupid soccer thing? Just, oh, I hate. oh, soccer's great, isn't it? <laughs> Do you think my, my beliefs are that wimpy one way or the other that you could just go, hey, and I'm gonna go, oh, I'm wrong about that. <laughs> you, you must be the debating team. <laughs> we believe that a Marxist comedy would be the best. Hey! On second thought, a capitalist economy is the only way to go. It's the amazingly powerful Harvard debating team. <laughs> All men should be free. Hey! <laughs> On the other hand, some of the scum should be locked up. Hey! <laughs> this is a really bad time. I have two foster daughters. This is a really bad time to be raising girls, uh, because you can't go into a store and buy like just a regular old pair of clothes that a kid could put on and enjoy and be fairly comfortable in. It's all gotta be this sort of, this sort of puffy, poofy, pink, shit that we wouldn't have been caught dead in when we were kids, by the way. <laughs> just with big old headbands, not even just head, head little brain crushing headbands. <laughs> big honking sunflowers on the side of it. You'll notice when kids get to about the second grade, the girls' heads are a little crookedy. That's because of that there. They're just saying, you know, oh, we really love school. And it's all gender stuff. You know, it's all to identify. You know, people are so sensitive about their babies. You know, when they have an infant, they want everybody to know that if it's a girl or a boy. Well, since at that point, really, the only thing that defines that difference at that pristine, pure moment is whether or not they have a penis or a vagina. And this is the only third time in my life I've ever said those words. <laughs> Why can't you just leave it at that? How about that it's not such a big deal whether you identify them or not, but people put like, before their kid even has hair, you know, they got some big old honking, hideous looking headband on their head. I just, and it, you know, it probably does, you know, their heads grow so fast when they're little, they're so soft before the skull is totally solid there that it probably does crush their brains, wouldn't you think? It's like a Chinese foot binding thing gone awry somehow. This is why it's the female side of the sex there that always has to be the morons. I was in an airport the other day and some guy had a baby and a you know, little pink frilly uncomfortable looking dress and before they can crawl, a dress is a horrible thing anyways or when they're learning to crawl because you can't get anywhere in that, you know, trips your kneesies. <laughs> There's a big old headband on and little pink patent leather shoes and I just wanted to go up to him and go, is it a boy? I 
two foster daughters. I don't think I have a particular gift for parenting. I, I, you know, I mean, I do all right. I, I try. Everybody makes you so nervous, though, you know? Everyone's got an opinion, and they insist on telling it to you. I mean, when my um, one baby was really, really a uh, baby baby, people would say to me, oh, you can't let her sleep on her stomach because Sid's babies were often babies that slept on their stomachs. And the pediatrician said to me, well, you can't let her sleep on her back because she could spit up and choke and drown. Well, you guys, those are pretty much the two major sides right there. <laughs> I slept with like an egg timer and a spatula by my bed. <laughs> Every 20 minutes I go in and flip the baby. <laughs> she cried constantly, that baby did too, the, uh, my second uh, foster child, just cried constantly. And you know, I never wished that she had uh, language at, at that point, but I sure did wish she had memory so that I could say to her someday, remember the time we were going to that restaurant, you screamed the entire time? What the hell was the matter with you? <laughs> and she could say, well, the tag on my shirt was rubbing. <laughs> I find, I mean, this goes without saying, I guess, but I find the discipline thing, like, so hard, you know? When you think about it, most of the discipline techniques that were used on us are now illegal. I was so frustrated by my four-and-a-half-year-old the other day that I said to her, like, I didn't know what to do anymore. And I, and I told her that. I said, you know, I don't know what to do with you. I said, how about this? For a minute, you be me, and I'll be you. And she went like this. No! I thought, you know, I knew my life sucked. But that it was so obvious that a four-and-a-half-year-old was terrified to be me for even a minute. My God. God, my life sucks. <laughs> and I've been to a shrink. It doesn't help. I was, I, I was having a really hard time at one point getting my infant to sleep through the night. At the worst part of it, she was awake 15 times a night. And uh, at the same time, I've been seeing shrinks for 10 years running, and I, I just switched to a new one. And the second time I went to see her, I was talking to her, and she fell asleep <laughs> while I was talking to her. Just dozed off. I saw her eyelids start to go, and her head kind of waggle sideways ever so slightly. And I had no idea what to say, which is part of the reason I'm in therapy. I had no, it was like the most, she wasn't any further than that away from me. I had no, finally, I just, I tucked a blanket up under her chin, left 90 bucks and got out of there. Then I realized, you know, they're, 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 I have a kid who wouldn't sleep through the night. If only I would just tell her my problems. That's what I started doing. I talked to her at night. I go, you know, I, I don't have sex. I'm not intimate with people. I don't have friends. She'd be out like a light. <laughs> I think the only reason I really, I, I think really the only reason I am a foster parent and every now and then I get another infant is because of the uh, equipment you get to get. You go to those baby stores where they have all the stuff like the, the cribs, each has like a, a different quilt and bumpers, and they each one have a different mobile hanging over top of it. And by the way, the mobiles now face the baby. The, the, the bears look down. Some engineer finally had the good sense to lay in the crib and look up and see what kids were seeing. We had rotating bear butts over our heads. God knows what that created in terms of, you know, people talk about the family falling apart and it, call, it causing, you know, sort of, you know, neuroses in us as adults. But no, it was rotating bear butts. <laughs> I was in a bookstore down the street from my house uh, one day with my uh, foster daughter who was at the time seven months old and I wanted to buy her some cardboard books because she was spazzing out and paking, paper cutting herself on regular books. And um, we go to the bookstore, it's this big huge store, and, and they were having a marathon reading of banned books. Um, obviously not books banned there in the store. Uh, but what people would do is there was a, a podium and a microphone and, and people would come up with a book and they would say what book they were reading and they would read the offensive passage from the book. And no matter where you were in the store, you could hear this. So we go back to the children's book section and you know, it's sort of just in my ears, uh, you know, kind of constantly. And now as I, I, I got like a big, huge stack of books, more than I meant to go, get, and uh, I was kind of lumbering back, trying not to spill them with the baby under this arm and a big, huge diaper bag on one shoulder. And as I get back towards the register, I hear this over the microphone, this guy say that he's now reading from Lady Chatterley's Lover. Well, most of the books, I honestly couldn't figure out what the offensive passage is if I wanted to. 
Uh, and I certainly probably would not be offended by it. However, this book, I can recognize what the offensive passage is. <laughs> I'm not offended by it, but I certainly can put my finger on what perhaps bothers other people. Um, it's a very graphic uh, description of sex in the book. And so as I near the counter to ask the lady to look up, by the way, and find out if they had a book for me, I suddenly hear from this um, speaker, is just pounding through the side of my head, the penis and the thrusting and the breasts and the heaving and the sweating and the, and, and this very, I was like totally embarrassed for just a brief moment because uh, I just like came upon the woman right at that moment. <laughs> and it was too late to stop myself from blurting out, do you have the pokey puppy? kind of ashamed of myself for even being embarrassed for a moment. I thought, how silly. And then I realized, well, part of the problem is, you know, there's a very, there were those, those words, and then there was these uh, imageries that they had. Like, it would say, uh, you know, it was like the, the pounding of the waves on the shore. It was like the coming up of the sun. It was like the dawning of man. And, you know, none of it was ringing a bell. <laughs> I am no expert on sex, for sure, but this was not sounding vaguely familiar to me. I think in terms of imagery, one time when the sex was not totally horrible, when I had sex, I closed my eyes and I pictured for a brief moment a freshly stirred glass of tang. That is the closest <laughs> I have ever come. You know, but I mean, when you really got it going and like the bubbles come in the middle and you, you know, let the spoon go and it circles a couple more times. Not my area, really. I thought I saw somebody with an MIT sweatshirt a few minutes ago. Right there, that guy. Do you go to MIT? You're what? I went there as an undergraduate. Oh, you went there as an undergraduate? And, 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 and what are you now? I'm a graduate student at Harvard. Oh, graduate student at Harvard. Uh huh. Why did you study at MIT? Uh, chemistry. Chemistry? Mm hmm. <laughs> and what are you studying at Harvard? Uh, chemistry. Chemistry? <laughs> you, what are you just double checking? MIT seems like a good school, but they may have been wrong about some things. What's MIT's slogan, by the way? Uh, mind and hands. What is it? Mind and hands. Mind and hands? <laughs> That's it, mind and hands? <laughs> you know what you may be confusing that with? Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. That's the school song at MIT. They come out at graduation, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. All right, you guys. I, uh, you know, I, the problem is I have a disease with talking. I can't stop talking. I don't know if you noticed that. I mean, I really appreciate that you're here. You're a really nice crowd, but to be honest with you, even if you weren't here, I'd still be talking. I just can't shut up for life for me, you know? It's, it's like a nervous thing, I think. It's like, sh it's shyness, but the opposite of it. I so can't stand silence. I have to fill it with my own voice as a general rule. And I'm more than interested in what other people have to say. I ask people about their lives, but what happens is somebody says something that reminds me of something that happened to me, I'm off and running. <laughs> and therefore, there's no like support group you could go to for it. <laughs> you know? I'd go to a thing, somebody would stand up and say, well, I, 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 I talk too much, and, 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 and I'd go, I talk too much, and then there I'd go. <laughs> There's a blind guy right in the front row, and I can't help but ask him this question. Now, sir, let me ask you something. This is something I'm so curious about. My best friend's mother is blind, and I never thought to ask her this question before, but don't people always say that you can hear better? Hear better? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, hear better. That's what I always say, because when you lose one sense, that your other senses become... I mean, you know the theory behind it, I'm sure. Is that your experience, that when you lost that one sense, that your other senses are stronger? Oh, yeah. Sure. Because, you know, I've said that um, I don't have sex, and I always assumed then 
that I would have an expertise in another area as a result. You see what I'm saying? You know what I mean? And, and I haven't noticed any area where I do excel, and I think maybe it's just something I haven't yet stumbled on, I haven't yet tried. Like, for example, maybe if I played croquet, it would turn out I'm fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you for telling me. I... All right, you guys, this time I really am going. I, um... Yeah, it's just, you know, I just can't shut up long enough to let you out of here. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to dismiss you one at a time. I think that's the best way to handle this. You know, the saddest thing about me talking all the time is that I am a gifted mime. Uh, I could have had a brilliant career, I just couldn't shut up. I would go like this here and then go, I'm in a box. And it gave it away. To go, Martin Luther King could come to my hotel room tonight and say to me, I had a dream, and I'd go, oh, I had a dream, only in mine. <laughs> you guys have been wonderful. Thank you very much.